On the morning of Sunday, May 17, 1998, David Wells woke up the same way thousands of Americans did, hungover. The New York Yankees hurler had spent the previous night partying with Saturday Night Live cast members Jimmy Fallon and Seth Meyers, and as he dragged himself to the ballpark, he didn't know if he would be able to see straight, much less pitch an entire Major League Baseball game. Little did he know that, only three hours later, he would be immortalized in baseball history, having led the Yankees to a win in one of the greatest pitching performances of all time. How did this unlikeliest of heroes reach this point? Let's rewind. Growing up in the San Diego neighborhood of Ocean Beach, David Lee Wells' childhood was unconventional. As a child, David had always been told that his father, David Pritt, had died. However, in a twist straight out of a daytime soap opera, he learned at the age of 22 that Pritt was actually still alive, and embarked on a journey to track him down. As for his mother, she spent much of David's childhood dating a man by the name of Crazy Charlie Mendez, who was actually an accountant. Nah, just kidding, he was in the Hell's Angels. Remember that kid on your Little League team whose entire family would come to every game? Well, imagine that kid, but replace their family with the most notorious biker gang in the country. For every batter David struck out, the bikers would give him a dollar. For every time he won, he'd get five. Wells once said that he could pull in a hundred bucks a game, and nobody would dare screw around with him. Try, and he'd say, I'll get my mom's boyfriend on you. Even as a teen, he was known for his out-of-control personality. He once told his high school teammates that he was going to walk the bases loaded on purpose, then strike out the side on nine pitches. And he did just that. His ability to pitch under pressure earned him a second round selection by the Toronto Blue Jays in the 1982 amateur draft, but his path to the major leagues was anything but smooth. He struggled his way through the Blue Jays' farm system, and by 1982 had worked his way up to double-A ball, appearing in eight games for the Tennessee Smokies. However, his progress was stopped in its tracks when he tours UCL in the middle of the 84 season, becoming only the third pitcher in history to undergo Tommy John surgery. A season and a half later, he got the call to the show, making his big league debut on June 30, 1987 against the New York Yankees. He lasted only four innings, letting up four runs in a Yankees win. The next week, he was sent back down after allowing five earned runs in only one and a third innings against the Royals. Well spent the next few years pitching out of the Toronto bullpen, until 1990 when he was promoted to the starting rotation to replace a struggling John Cerruti. What started out as a temporary measure turned out to be a defining moment for Wells' career, as he finished the 1990 season with an 11-6 record and a 3.14 ERA over 189 innings pitched. He was a key piece in the 1992 Blue Jays World Series victory, giving up only one hit and no runs over four relief appearances in the Fall Classic. After the season, Wells gave an interview where he expressed his desire to be a full-time starter. I think I proved something not pitching for 21 days and getting into the World Series and showing I can pitch. Toronto General Manager Gord Ash had other ideas, releasing Wells on March 30, 1993. It didn't take long for Wells to find a new team, signing a one-year deal with the Tigers, who'd had the worst team ERA in the American League the previous season. With Toronto, he had been pressured by the club to conform, dealing with a constant onslaught of complaints about his inconsistency, his temper, his weight, and his penchant for beer. In Detroit, Wells thrived, in large part thanks to manager Sparky Anderson's willingness to let him be himself. However, by mid-1995, it was clear that the Tigers were going nowhere. The only bright spot on an otherwise awful pitching staff, Wells was shipped off to the contending Cincinnati Reds on July 31st, where he helped the team to the NLCS. After spending the 1996 season on the Baltimore Orioles, with whom he put up a less than stellar 11-14 record and a 5.14 ERA, Wells caught the attention of the New York Yankees, who signed him to a three-year, $13.5 million contract that winter. The Yankees had had their eye on Wells for quite a while. Two years earlier, New York had come close to trading away a top minor league prospect to the Tigers in exchange for Wells' services, but changed their minds at the last minute. That prospect? A young pitcher by the name of Mariano Rivera. Wells didn't take long to start ruffling feathers in New York. He asked to wear Babe Ruth's number 3, which the Yankees of course refused, so he went with number 33 instead. That way, I can be Babe Ruth twice over. Before I continue, I wanted to take a second to really dive into David Wells' obsession with Babe Ruth. When I say Wells is obsessed with Ruth, I mean he is obsessed with Ruth. In addition to the uniform number, Wells has a tattoo of the Bambino across the entirety of his pitching arm. 
But perhaps the most significant example of his infatuation with the Babe occurred on June 28, 1997, when he took the mound against Cleveland, sporting a game-worn Babe Ruth cap from 1934, which he had purchased for $35,000. Yankees manager Joe Torre found out about it after the first inning and ordered Wells to remove the cap, though maybe he should have let Wells keep wearing it, since he went on to blow a 3-0 lead in a 12-8 Yankees loss. But for all the attention he drew as a result of his off, and sometimes on, field antics, David Wells was effective during his time in pinstripes. He posted a 16-10 record in 1997 with a 4.21 ERA over 218 innings. But despite a solid pitching performance from Wells in Game 3, the Yankees were bounced from the ALDS by Cleveland. Entering the 1998 season, Wells was approaching 35, overweight, and recovering from a strained rib muscle. Most players would likely take that as a sign that it's time to hang up the spikes. Indeed, after a May 6th start in which he gave up seven earned runs to Texas over just two and two-thirds innings, Torrey pulled Wells aside to have a long discussion about his fitness. So when he took the mound against the Twins two weeks later, no one was expecting much. The only thing most fans were looking forward to that day were the souvenir stuffed animals being given away at the gate as part of Beanie Baby Day at Yankee Stadium. What they got instead was a pitching masterclass from the man affectionately known as Boomer. Wells sat down all 27 Minnesota batters in order, striking out 11 as he became the first pitcher to throw a perfect game in Yankee Stadium since Don Larson during the 1956 World Series. Coincidentally, Larson was an alumnus of Point Loma, where David Wells attended high school. In his autobiography, Wells recounted his experience that day. I was half drunk, with bloodshot eyes, monster breath, and a raging, skull-rattling hangover. He had gone to bed at 5 a.m. the previous night and gotten just one hour of sleep. Despite helping the Yankees win their 24th World Series title that year, he was traded to the Blue Jays in the offseason for flamethrower and anger management guru Roger Clemens. Having learned from their previous mistakes, this time around, Toronto let Boomer be Boomer, heavy metal music and all. Over the next two seasons, Wells continued his success, having his first and only 20-win year in 2000. But once again, his personality turned out to be too much for the Jays, and they sent him to the White Sox in early 2001. Following a disappointing season, Yankees owner George Steinbrenner made the surprise move of bringing back the 39-year-old. David Wells is a winner, and he belongs in pinstripes, said Steinbrenner. People say we're going out on a limb, but we'll see. We're betting on the boomer. The bet paid off, with Wells leading the pitching staff in victories with 19. But he struggled in the playoffs, and the 103-win Yankees couldn't pull through in the World Series. By 2003, Wells had earned the ire of New York management, in large part due to the publishing of his autobiography, in which he claimed, among other things, that a number of Yankees players were taking steroids. The team fined him $100,000, and he was off the club after another World Series loss. Wells bounced around the league during the last few years of his career, making appearances for the Red Sox and his hometown Padres, before finally retiring with the Dodgers at age 44. Over the course of his 21-year Major League career, David Wells accrued a record of 239 and 157, over 2,000 strikeouts, and a pair of World Series rings. And while he was never quite the best in the league, he was certainly one of the most fun to watch. The game of baseball has no shortage of big personalities, but I know this for a fact, there will never be another David Wells.